I guess I don't have to tell you all what a great author and amazing um, analyst and journalist David Ignatius is, because this is the largest crowd uh, we've had here all year. This is amazing. I don't know what you've done. You need more novel. You need more novelists. <laughs> more novelists. Uh, seriously, David is um, the David Cornwall, i.e., uh, Jean Le Carré, uh, of our time. But I will say this and maybe get in trouble if David Cornwall still around. You're much better. The the. Uh, <laughs> The, there's a real plot, a real thriller aspect to the books, and the characters are very alive. And you're a journalist, so you actually know a lot of the stuff about what's happening in Pakistan. This book uh, is for everybody. It's a thriller about spies and counter spies and CIA and rogue CIA uh, uh, operations in Pakistan. But it's also about a London hedge fund which is cool, so if you don't like spies and you like, you're one of those people like hedge fund managers, you'll like this book too. Are there, do such people exist? No, not in this room. <laughs> anyway, let me start by asking, why did you write this book? Is it a better way to sometimes get at the real truth than you can in some of your stories? Well, uh, that's true with all my novels. I have to be honest. Uh, a friend said to me once, David, the only time you really tell the truth is in your fiction. And there is a, a strange way in which writing a novel with that big canvas to paint on, and for whatever reason, without that sense of a gallery of Washington and the world perched on your shoulder as you type each keystroke, uh, it, it can be easier to, to unpack the truth and really express um, all of the details of, of, of what you think about an issue. Uh, this book, I actually am holding the British edition. If you if you happen to find yourselves in in uh, in Manchester or, or Doha, this is what you'll see. Um, this book began as a very different book. I wrote uh, a laborious fifteen thousand word outline. I mean, that's you know the book as a uh, as a whole is a hundred thousand words. So I wrote this enormous outline about another book. And in 2009, as I was working on that other book, which did have a hedge fund in it, uh, I began going to Pakistan. And I found myself absolutely riveted as a journalist, but just as a writer, as somebody trying to understand the world with what I was seeing there. Uh, I first went with Richard Holbrook, rest in peace, and Admiral Mullen uh, on an unforgettable trip, just as Richard was beginning his tenure in April 2009. Uh, we uh, met with uh, <coughs> courageous young people from the tribal areas of Pakistan who came to a safe house in Islamabad. Richard's network had organized this classic Richard Holbrook thing to do. And uh, we all sat around, and these kids were so brave and articulate in telling us what was happening in the tribal areas, uh, what was wrong. Um, as, as we got back on the plane later, we were uh, informed that as they were leaving Islamabad to go back to Peshawar and then to their tribal agencies, they'd all been stopped by the ISI and arrested and, and quizzed. What, what were you doing talking to these Americans? You know, who do you think you are? This is Pakistan. So that got my attention. And then I, I traveled... Uh, later in 2009, uh, I'd always wanted to go to South Waziristan, don't ask me why, um, and met with, uh, I was allowed to write this in a column, so I'm happy to say it to this audience, I uh, had, had a long dinner with the, the Director General of the ISI, uh, General Pasha. Is General Malik in this book based on him to some extent? It says right here, I can read yeah. it to you. <laughs> this is a novel... Is this a novel and none of the characters are real? None of the characters are real. This is, uh, uh, of course not. <laughs> okay. um, I did get, I did get, after the book was published, I did get a note from someone in the ISI, very close to the top, not, not from General Pasha, and the first line of it was, David. <laughs> I could not put it down. No. So I've been, I've been tempted to use that as a blurb. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's... ISI. Um, All right. David, buy yourself a bulletproof vest. Ooh. That would, I, that's the one I didn't want to get. So anyway, it's, it's 2009, and I'm, I'm, I'm traveling in the tribal areas, bumping around in a two-seater plane uh, with 
uh, somebody who the ISI has arranged to, to fly me into South Waziristan. Uh, and uh, this uh, landscape of Pakistan, physical, uh, emotional, um, and the landscape of espionage, a place where the things that a spy novelist is interested in, the sort of gray area in which you know double and triple uh, games are being played, games so complicated you, you, sometimes you can't even see all the knots in the in the thread, um, was suddenly the thing that was that, that was you know overwhelming me. So my fifteen thousand word outline, whoosh, you know. Um, I just I, f- I found that I wasn't interested in in, in the, the book that I'd sketched. I was interested in this other book that was taking shape in my mind, and I began writing it. Uh, I had a long break where I just hid out in Paris in my old apartment. Any any friends here who remember remember mm-hmm. my old apartment in Paris? Pretty nice place to hide out. Mm-hmm. And and I just uh, so I began writing this very different book. So um, it, it's one that that was. That was, uh, you know, vestiges of the earlier, the hedge fund themes survive, and I think they do enrich the book. But it, writers will often say, you know, I didn't really write the book, the book wrote me. And that's one of those slightly odd, elusive comments. But it's really true, and this is a perfect example. You know, the, these events that I was seeing, what they then stimulated in, in my writer's imagination just took over, and that was it. I, I want to stress that this is not just a wonderful geopolitical book. It is a great, delightful piece of writing. There, As you read it, you'll see phrases in it. I think my favorite was, a ruined man is easier to read than a fresh and eager one. This is from the ISI lieutenant general when he's looking at the burned-out well, ca- uh, CIA officer, and he can't read them. It's a, harder, it's, a, it's a ruined man is harder to read because he can... Hide his lies under the folds of, is, yeah. of flesh and the, and the bags under his eyes. Harder to read a ruined man. You can't tell what's still alive. Anyway, um, one reason this is much different from the Jean Le Carré genre is in Spy Who Came In from the Cold type books, we know that the Russian KGB is our enemy. This is very complicated because the ISI is both friend and foe in this book and in the real world. How does that uh, fit into this? Well, we've been living out that story uh, in the last week in the most dramatic form yet in this crazy relationship between the CIA and the ISI, the United States and and Pakistan. You know, I've said uh, in, in public in the past that if this was a married couple, you'd you tell them to get a divorce. Um, and then I've amended that sometimes to say you'd tell them to go to counseling because uh, divorce would have uh, ruinous consequences. But just think back over the last week. We had Admiral Mullen last Wednesday testifying before the Senate, which gives it extra weight. Admiral Mullen, who has been Pakistan's best friend in the U.S. government, who's been criticized by some of his colleagues through two administrations for being too friendly, too willing to uh, overlook uh, uh, their their bad behavior. You have Admiral Mullen saying that the Haqqani Network, which has just attacked the American embassy in Kabul, and we have to remember that... And killed the CIA officers as well, yeah, right? And and, and in Carlotta Gall's uh, piece uh, earlier in 2007, we believe was responsible for the death of, of, of Americans in a, in a just outright... But just imagine, go back to September 14, two weeks ago, uh, this attack on our embassy compound in Kabul. It's the most secure place I know in, in the world. It is hard to get in there. It's hard to get in there if you're an American. Um, imagine if, if the ambassador... Our, our new ambassador, Ryan Crocker, or one of the top political officers had been killed. I mean, imagine if that had succeeded. Imagine if in the attack that came three days earlier on a NATO garrison in, in, in Warsaw uh, to the uh, uh, southeast of, southwest of Kabul, uh, southeast of Kabul, um, imagine if instead of 70 wounded in that attack, it was a huge truck bomb, there had been 70 dead. Uh, and you see how close the Pakistanis have allowed this to get to the edge. So here's Admiral Mullen 
I, th I think you have to read this as a, as a wake-up call. Pakistan's best friend saying before the Senate, you are using a terrorist organization that attacks our embassy and truck bombs our soldiers as a veritable arm of your policy. It's an extraordinary statement. And it was intended to be. And it got, it got Pakistan's attention. It got Pakistan's attention both in a negative way, you know, demonstrators in the streets, how dare he, you know, anti-American, this and that. But it also got, a, got their attention in a, in a deeper and more significant way where people said, you know, we always think the Americans need us more than we need them, but maybe, maybe we're wrong. So in the last week, there have been all kinds of things going on to readjust this relationship in a more positive way. Um, Karen DeYoung, my, my very talented colleague, this morning offered a modest um, amendment to the public position that Admiral Mullen had, mm -hmm. had left, which was to say that Admiral Mullen's statement should not be read as stating that the ISI planned and executed these attacks uh, on its own, that, that they may have had knowledge of or could have controlled but didn't, and not they directly planned them. So that story this morning is a very deliberate recalibration of the, of the U.S. position. Admiral Mullen was asked yesterday through his spokesman, do you withdraw your earlier comments? And he said, no, I do not. And so uh, that's, um, there are all kinds of other things that have been going on. Um, you know, uh, sh shamelessly, I'm going to say you're going to have to wait uh, until my column appears Friday or Sunday to find out what I know. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of reporting, and there's this is a, uh, this is an you know as, as interesting as you think the story is, it's actually quite a lot more interesting even than you knew. Um, how's that for a tease? Yeah. You said earlier that you revised your opinion that maybe we should just get a divorce. But why couldn't we get a divorce from the ISI and being in bed with Pakistani military? And is the military and ISI pretty much the same? Yes. Okay. There, there's a, a mistake that the Pakistanis encourage of thinking that the ISI is independent of the military, a rogue operator, you know, but you, know, you can count on the generals. The ISI is, is a part of the Pakistani military. General Kiani, who now is the chief of army staff, was the director general of the ISI before Pasha. Pasha's background is actually in operations, not in intelligence. It's one problem he's had in running this service is, you know, he doesn't have all the threads in his hand. But um, you, you shouldn't uh, imagine that, um, that, that, that there's any distinction. Um, your first question was, why shouldn't we get a divorce? Um, I'll express a, a, a personal view about most strategic issues that applies to this, which is that over time I have come to think that the bold, decisive stroke that is very attractive, that's very tempting, and that, and that people like us are always screaming for, uh, take action, you know, no more flip-flopping, <laughs> decisive policy, um, often gets you in trouble. That um, the, 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 the fundamental reality is that right now when we have uh, a, a large army in Afghanistan fighting a very difficult war, we do need Pakistan. We need them for supply route. Um, we need them, in a sense, to avoid a, war, a wider war that would keep us in Afghanistan or in some expanded version of Afghanistan for a lot longer than the president or the country would like. One Wait, danger, before you move on from that, let me yeah. then ask the counter, which is if we got ourselves out of Afghanistan, will we still need Pakistan? Uh, it depends on what kind of uh, uh, political settlement is reached in Afghanistan, the extent to which Pakistan is a player, the extent to which the other regional players, particularly India, yeah. accept and endorse the structure that we built and Pakistan's role in it. I mean, you know, my own view is that Afghanistan is going to be pretty ragged for a good long while. 
you know, certainly well past another the 2014. Two, yeah. Maybe another century or two, or two. I don't, I don't think that, actually. Mm. But, but, you know, saw a decade, uh, 15, 20 years, I don't know. But if you can build a structure that's strong enough to contain that instability, mm-hmm. it's, it's acceptable. It's like the Taif Agreement, which stabilized Lebanon. You know, Lebanon had had a, you know, freewheeling uh, civil war with, with tens of thousands dead. It was a, you know, a real regional headache. And then you had a regional agreement that sort of built a house or a containment wall around that Lebanon. All of the same conflicts existed. They periodically flare up. Um, you know, hopefully we've done that in Iraq. I mean, Iraq, every day, every other day, you read, you know, 10 die in a car bomb. But it doesn't, you know, it's, it's sort of in a containment vessel. So if you can do that, I think that's acceptable. We'd certainly need Pakistan's uh, help. One danger, I would just say, uh, this is obvious, and it was said last night on the... Uh, News Hour by some very good commentators, Jack Keane and Wally Nasser. It's worth repeating. To the extent that we make the Haqqani network and its outrageous Pakistani condoned terrorism against America a big issue, a big screaming issue, where you have senators getting up and making speeches, it is likely, in my judgment, that we will delay the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. You know, it's what we're doing in, in making these very emphatic statements that this is not tolerable and that Pakistan's behind it is meaning that we, it'll be much harder to take forces out. I mean, the generals are already worried. The effect of the, of the, of the, of the reduction in the surge forces, bluntly, is that the campaign that the generals had wanted to make in RC East, in the east of Afghanistan, which is where the Haqqanis are, um, will be harder because we have fewer troops to do it. They had hoped that they would have enough of the surge troops left to really make a push in the east. That's going to be harder. So, you know, honestly, if we're declaring war on the Haqqanis, and they're going to fight back, they're tough fellows, uh, you're going to have to rethink that timetable, in my judgment. And people need to see that. They need to see that beneath the last week's uh, back and forth is this very tough issue for the United States, war-weary United States, that may mean we have to ha- have troops there longer. There's uh, some analysis that if we start divorcing ourselves from Pakistan, that they will drift into China's orbit, sphere of influence. It sort of reminds me of uh, Churchill, I think, and von Ribbentrop, when von Ribbentrop said, we warn you that if we go to war again, meaning World War II, this time we'll have Italy on our side. And Churchill said, it's only fair, last time we had to have them. I mean, why don't we, why don't we, um, why don't we want Pakistan, China ha- to have to take responsibility for Pakistan? Well, it, it, uh, that's a great, uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, I think, I mean, the, the truth is the Pakistanis, uh, the, the, the Chinese being sensible, have no interest in substituting for the United States as a strategic guarantor of, of, of Pakistan and, and have signaled that. The, um, a Pakistani friend said to me the last time relations were really bad with the United States and, you know, we were on the breach of, a, of a breaking off the relationship and he said, and this was just as their foreign minister was going to China or something like that, he said, Aha, at last we're on the right side of history. America is in decline, and a rising China is our friend. And I looked at him and I thought, you are nuts. <laughs> you know, the, 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 China, the Chinese, you know, one thing they're smart enough to avoid is getting into this complete mess. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of, of hopes about bringing China into Afghanistan. China ha- has signed a deal to develop the, some of the mineral wealth of Afghanistan and build a railroad and, you know, is it any surprise that it's really not going anywhere? Uh, I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're going to wait they're until the it's stabilized. They're the only big nation smart enough in the past two centuries not to get involved in Afghanistan, it seems. Well, that's a good, that's a good way to put it. They're s- smarter than the Brits, smarter than we are. I mean, I always think of the Chinese, Russians. Walter, uh, uh, smarter than the Russians, yeah. as, uh, as, you know, in a stock car race, and not to pretend that I know a lot about stock car racing, but, you know, you have the lead car that's, you know, barreling along at 200 miles an hour, and then you have 
other cars behind that are slipstreaming, as they call it, you know, which, which are just following the, there's really an, an accelerating pull from the air and, you know, uh, uh, movement of that lead car. And the Chinese very wisely, I, I think really since Deng Xiaoping, have made the decision that they're going to slipstream behind this big, powerful America. It's made them unbelievably rich in a hurry. Uh, I think what's disturbed the Chinese is sensing that we're not that, you know, the, that our, we're losing horsepower, that that big, fast car isn't quite as fast as it was. And, and they, you know, that's, that, for whatever they say, that's not in their interest. But I, I don't, I don't, I think, the, you know, if they're not willing to play a significant role in the security affairs in North Korea next door to them, why would anybody imagine that they would go further afield to, to Pakistan and, by implication, Afghanistan? It's not going to happen. Well, let me go back to touting this novel, and then we'll open it up so they can talk geopolitics or novel. Um, you have some amazing characters in there, and maybe we could just, instead of ruining the plot, just introduce your characters. Sophie Marks, a woman... Uh, counter, counter, counter agent doing a rogue, or not a rogue, but an authorized but out of channel operation. Great character. Um, she was a, a fun character to write. She's the second woman heroine I've had in my novels. Um, I had a, a woman uh, in my second novel, Ciro, who had a kind of fancy Washington background and, uh, and mm -hmm. went to Holden Arms or NCS or something like that. And, um, this character doesn't have a lot of emotional or personal baggage. Uh, she is typical of women officers that I've met, uh, younger women in, in the clandestine service. Um, she's fit. She's independent. She's not very good at relationships. Um, she's decisive. Um, uh, she, she is very wise to the BS that men throw around. Um, are there a lot in of women like that in the clandestine service? Yes, there, 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 there are some. There are some very good officers, some very, very tough ones. Often, when I travel overseas, uh, visit an embassy, you know, somebody will kind of after we've had the, you know, country team meeting, uh, and there's somebody who has a sort of weird uh, little name tag on their on their uh, place. Uh, that person will come over to me and say. I probably shouldn't do this, but I just want to say hi and I really enjoy your books. And, um, and often that person is a woman, and it's the chief of station. So the, the number of, of chiefs of station who are women is a, is a growing number, and, and, and you know, uh, it will ha it'd be interesting. There, someday there'll be a woman who's head of the clandestine service. That will be a, a real uh, breakthrough moment. Um, so, you know, how realistic is she? I don't, I don't know. The, the, somebody said to me, a uh, woman said to me this week, you know, David, uh, I was so disappointed at the end of your book. I, I love Sophie Marks. I really related to her. Why did she have to have a happy ending defined by finding a man she liked? <laughs> and I, I said... I said, well, she didn't sleep. She didn't sleep with him. She hasn't, you know. There's no, you know. I, I, I kept her. You know, she, she. We, when we meet her, she was waking up in a big bed, thinking men are unreliable. You know, men. She's just. She's used to sleeping in a big bed alone. So, um, I said, well, you know. I mean, isn't it true? We all do. We seek completeness. We, see, you know, love seeks an object. Don't we want to love somebody else? You know. And this woman looked at me and said. No, not all of us. <laughs> Some people don't. What's wrong with that? And it was, it was very much in your face. And I was thinking, that actually, that would be quite an interesting woman character, a woman who really had, you know, was, was um, as uninterested in, in attachment as, as the most roguish man you ever met. So, you know, maybe next book. <laughs> uh, General Muhammad Malik. Well... Um, Lieutenant despite General. your completely uh, <laughs> outrageous suggestion that he might bear any resemblance to <laughs> Lieutenant General uh, Ahmed Suja Pasha, the head of the ISI, he, he is he is he is an, uh, an imaginary character. You know, my characters are, are drawn from from life. 
Um, he, so here are a few things about him. Um, the first, uh, you could say, is like a bio- biographical detail in the history of General Kiani, his boss. Um, he spent time in the United States. In fact, at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, where a lot of foreign officers go for training. Um, he has been pretending ever since then that he loves the, the, the heartland, you know, the middle of America. In fact, he didn't like Kansas at all. Uh, he liked the Rockies. Uh, his family is from Kashmir originally. But he has, you know, been pretending, I say, sort of shamming in the way, you know, in this sincere and also false way that is part of that, that part of the world that, that he loves, you know, he loves these, uh, these Americans from Kansas ever since. Um, and I say of him, to say that he was playing a double game didn't do him justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was it was it was more complicated than that. Um, it was you know like um, you know elect- electrons whose state is impossible in fact to determine you know which whether it was double or triple at any given moment would be uh, perhaps impossible to say. And I think that is a, a, a true picture of how that service operates. I, I should note that as as devious a character as General Malik is. He's not all that much more devious than the heads of most intelligence services. I mean, we forget um, that intelligence services exist to lie. If you could do something in a straightforward way, the State Department would do it. Um, You know, intelligence services, at a minimum, exist to systematically break the laws of other countries by, you know, bribing their nationals to commit treason, by breaking into places, by, you know, that's what they're there for. They're they're there to break other countries' laws. And under Title 50, we give, and this is a few teeny words in the National Security Act of 1947, which talks about how the the President and the National Security Council shall shall authorize other such actions as may be deemed necessary. I think that's the phrase. Mm -hmm. On that has been hung the whole structure of covert action. Um, you know, which is deniable action. The things the United States is going to do for raison d'etat, a reason of, of absolute national interest in other countries that are illegal under their laws and that we will deny if we are caught, if this is exposed, it is the policy sanctioned by law that will deny it. So, uh, you know, when you think of, of, of how terrible General Malik is, you know, how devious the Pakistanis are. It is important to remember that this is what intelligence agencies do. And I think, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of games going in different directions with the Pakistanis, as, as this book uh, makes clear. Um, so, yeah, so that's General Malik. But uh, real quick on General Malik, what game is he, or the real-life Pakistani ISI, playing with the Haqqani network? I mean, what, what is their goal? Well, so there, there, there are different layers uh, of, of answer, uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, tell you the different layers. Um, the first layer is um, it is essential, especially now, for us to have good intelligence about this terrorist group that is seeking to kill Americans so that we can have some intelligence, maybe a tiny degree of control, you know, do do we, do we, do we have contacts? Do we use our contacts? Of course. You know, that's what intelligence services are are there for. That's what we do. My first novel was called Agents of Innocence, was about how the CIA recruited and ran Arafat's chief of intelligence for almost 10 years at a time when the PLO was our leading terrorist adversary. He was finally assassinated, our agent, our man in the PLO, he was assassinated by Israel, which regarded him entirely appropriately as a leading terrorist who was involved in, if not responsible for, the Munich massacre. So, you know, have we ever played double games that that are on ambiguous moral ground? Uh, We certainly have. So, but that would be their first answer is, for the most basic intelligence reasons, it's important for us to have contact. The second layer of answer would be, if you Americans mean what you say about seeking a political settlement in Afghanistan, it is crucial that we have some leverage 
with the parties that you're going to want to bring to the table because a reconciliation, a stable peace that will allow your soldiers to leave won't be possible uh, without that leverage, without these people sitting around the table. So, so then that, that they would say, um, it's crucial that we ma- maintain our links with Haqqanis, even though it infuriates you, because otherwise we're never going to get to the place that, that you want to be. Uh, a third layer of answer would be, and each of these ha- has some truth, would be it's this, the, the structure of the ISI itself. As I mentioned earlier, General Pasha, who, who is a two-star general, uh, three-star general, who, who runs the service, comes from a different part of the Pakistani military. The Pakistanis, following British tradition, uh, with our encouragement when we were trying to nail the Russians uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, used what the British used to call forward-deployed methods of recruitment. And that basically meant, and the, and the Brits, uh, you know, read Kim, uh, if you want an example of this, the great Rudyard Kipling novel, or read any of these histories of the, the, the Brits in a great game. They would send, you know, some second son from Eton, you know, brilliant, adventurous lad, uh, and they'd, they'd just send him off into the hinterlands and say, learn the language, learn the culture, report back when you know something. Uh, and and it, as you'll read in these histories, I mean, they're just incredible uh, uh, tales of these of these fellows and the, what what they did, what they what they got into. Mm-hmm. They were wanderers. They were they were they would call themselves geographers. They'd have you know this cover or that, but they were intelligence officers. The Pakistanis began to do this with what they call their S wing, their strategic wing, uh, and the officers were forward deployed in these very rough tribal settings, and their assignment was get to know these people, mm-hmm. get to pray with them, go to mosque with them, you know, sit with their sons in the madrasa, uh, develop contacts with them, and then, you know, over time, uh, develop relationships where, you know, we'll, we'll pay them with American money uh, to do things uh, against, against, against the Russians. Uh, so these forward-deployed operatives of S-Wing became kind of a law unto themselves. It was very hard for, you know, the center to control them, to know what they were up to, to be in, in easy contact with them. I mean, it sounds far-fetched, but it, uh, the example I sometimes cite is the CIA's and America's difficulty in dealing with the Bay of Pigs Cubans. I mean, you know... We, who we recruited, our CIA recruited for a covert action that was meant to be an invasion that would topple Fidel Castro in Cuba. As we all know, it's one of the great disasters. It was ill-planned. The CIA kind of wandered in thinking it'll be such a mess, they'll have to use air cover, and then we'll somehow succeed. Um, okay, it was a big screw-up. And then you had all these Cubans who'd been recruited in the, in the program who were kind of floating around in American life ever since. And, you know, where do they pop up? Well, it depends on what set of conspiracy theories you want to buy. <laughs> I'm from New Orleans. We pop up they, like they, some, some through via New Orleans, would, would, would put them into the story of the assassination of President Kennedy. Um, certainly, they are central to the story of Watergate, which is the, the biggest, uh, you know, I would say, discontinuity in modern American political life. I mean, that came right out of Howard Hunt, who ran them, was a case officer who was running them, and then all of his operatives. Were. So, you know, it's very hard once you start this thing rolling, once you start a covert action and bring people into this secret world where you're, it's all about violating laws, reeling them back in is hard. That is one thing the ISI has found, reeling back in the, the S-wing, you know, controlling its operatives, controlling its former members who still hang out with the people who used to be their agents, yeah. is not easy. So uh, I, I don't think that's a, an adequate excuse, but it's, I, I do think it's a statement of fact. Mm-hmm. Real quickly, one last question about the novel, and then we'll open it up. Uh, is it what, Jeff Gewertz, right? Uh, yes. Uh, who, uh, the other great, another great character. And also, does the CIA have, like in Century City, California, <laughs> its own uh, wings there that we don't know about, or um, we don't know about? Well, if we, if we really don't know, then we really don't know. Um, so uh, Jeff Gertz is, um, you know, a, a kind of very 
tough, you'd want to say amoral, uh, kind of classic case officer type um, who's, who's, who's done well um, in his career and who is part of a group that essentially says to a new president, aren't you tired of having a CIA that has this big kick me sign on its backside that's always getting in trouble, that you know, Congress wants to micromanage, that you know, has to hold family day in the courtyard? You know, uh, you know, I mean, what kind of intelligence service is that? Um, don't you want a, a truly clandestine service? And if you do, let's take the kinds of things we do for the relatively few no, uh, officers who are under, under non-official covers, so-called NOCs, and, and expand it. So we have something far from headquarters. In this case, it is in Studio City, California. It's a proprietary. You know, CI famously uses proprietary companies a lot. And it, it, it is away from headquarters. It reports directly to the White House. You know, I mean, the CIA, we, we have to remember, is an executive arm of the president to do th things the president feels are necessary to be done. There are inform procedures for informing Congress, but it is, you know, Congress isn't really, wants to be, but it isn't in that loop. It is an arm of the president. And, you know, there's nothing to prevent the kind of thing I'm imagining, because I don't think it exists, from happening in the future, from somebody saying, you know what, our clandestine service isn't clandestine. It can't really do the kind of espionage and other operations that are necessary for the United States because it isn't secret. So let's do this right, which means do it in a way that's really secret. So I was just having fun with that idea. At some point, somebody is going to have that idea for real. Uh, maybe they'll remember this book and, <laughs> and, and have a few things on their don't list. But you know... Uh, it's amazing how truth has a way of catching up with fiction after a while. So I'm sure it will happen. Well, I, yes, go ahead. Uh, David Garrett Mitchell, um, it's a brilliant book. I, I, if, you, if you haven't purchased it yet, go get it. Uh, and like your friend at the uh, ISI, I couldn't put it down either, but probably for different mm -hmm. reasons. Um, A dozen years ago or so, um, Billy Collins, the poet, was being interviewed by Terry Gross, and they had this wonderful conversation and went through lots of his poetry, and, and she asked, you know, the sort of, when did you get interested, and he talks about he starts writing it when he's in elementary school, and then it's, it's, a, it's a profession, and, and then she, she asked him a question, it turns out that he'd never been asked before, and there was dead silence, and she said to him, when did you decide you were a poet? Mm -hmm. And um, the question that, that I have, because I read, of course, your, your nonfiction uh, in, the, uh, in the Washington Post and then your fiction, um, which is really as close to nonfiction as you can get uh, in these books. And I wondered, you, you've made, as far as I can tell, two professional decisions in your life. One is to be a journalist, and the second was to be a novelist. And I'm interested in which came first. And, that's a good uh, question. Why don't we let David uh, take it? That's, that's a wonderful question. I, I should say, uh, Garrett, Garrett uh, writes one of the best uh, newsletters in Washington um, and is, uh, follows the world I write about closely. Um, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I dreamed, as every under, like the, one of the definitions of being an undergraduate, uh, of being a novelist, you know, writing creatively. And I had a class with Robert Fitzgerald, who was famously the translator of Homer, the, the Odyssey and the Iliad, uh, a man who, well, I, I was going to tell a terrible story about him, but I won't. Um, I actually took that class, too. It was a great yeah, class. Robert Fitzgerald. But, well, it's you a know, terrible story. <laughs> well, we'll do it later, if you like. <laughs> well, it, it shouldn't shouldn't be repeated. Okay. It's about it's about something his ex wife was supposed to say. Um, <laughs> well, later. <laughs> I should buy late. the book. You'll get the um, <laughs> So uh, I I I I dreamed in that class of being a, a creative writer, and I and I realized that I really wasn't very good at it. 
that uh, there was a kind of preciousness to my writing. It was, you know, sort of classic undergraduate uh, fiction. And uh, so I kind of put that idea away. And I found that being in the world as a, as a journalist, uh, Walter and I, I mean, like Walter, you and I both ex- found the same thing, that, that my, my first job, you know, I went to St. Albans, then Harvard, then Cambridge, uh, and my first job was covering the Steelworkers Union in, in Pittsburgh for the Wall Street Journal. And I had to make friends with steelworkers up and down the Monongahela Valley, and I had to go to steelworker conventions, and I absolutely loved it. You know, I just loved getting out of my my skin and into other people's, and I and I was hooked as a, as a journalist. I've never really lost that that uh, excitement. I ran into a story in my career that made me become a novelist because I had no other way to deal with it. I had written a story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal in February 1983 that said what I said earlier that the CIA for 10 years ran as an asset Yasser Arafat's chief of intelligence, Abu Hassan Salame, until he was assassinated by the Israelis, who knew that he was our agent. I wrote that on the front page. In April, and the, and, every, and the PLO flipped out. I mean, they just, you know, uh, I, Arafat w- was very ups- upset and threatening uh, in April 1983, uh, the case officer who had run that operation, a true American hero, I need to, just to say that, I mean, a, a man named Robert Ames, who was as gifted uh, an intelligence officer as the country ever produced, with the possible exception of Lucky's husband, Archie, um, came to Beirut to see various people. Uh, I was in the embassy seeing the U.S. military attaché about a half hour before, uh, at 1 o'clock, 1.03 in the afternoon, a truck arrived at the embassy door, and the biggest truck bomb anybody had seen up to that point exploded. I had just gotten to the top of the hill to the Commodore Hotel when I heard the loudest explosion I'd ever heard in Beirut. And Robert Ames, this, this wonderful, remarkable man, had been killed along with every other member of the CI station who was in town that day. Uh, they all had gone down to the cafeteria to have lunch, and so they were all killed. So there was this um, unlikely situation in which I was the only American in Beirut who knew something about this amazing operation that had been going on, in which we had had intimate contact with the most sensitive people and parts of Arafat's organization. In the aftermath of the death of Ames, in the weeks and months, uh, Arabs who knew about this and who were grieving because this was somebody they had established an intimate bond with needed somebody to talk to, and I was that person. And so I began to learn a kind of detail about what had been going on that journalists don't hear, for good reason. And so, Gary, you know, the answer to your question is, it was obvious the only way I could possibly write something would be in the form of a novel. And when I when I left, stopped covering the Middle East, came back to Washington, I began work on it. Uh, I I remember I sent a letter to Ames's widow living in Atlanta, asking if I could come see her and do what, you know, good nonfiction writers like Walter do, you know, look at family photographs, you know, talk, get documents, letters. And I, and I realized, my gosh, if I do that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I might as well write nonfiction, which I can't. So I said to this woman, I, I, I'm going to cancel that trip I was going to make. And I began trying to reimagine the story with all the details that I knew in my mind, and that's when I became a novelist. Okay, so the last thing to say about this, and I, this is really important, I'll say this to, to audiences of younger people. Um, I submitted this novel to every major publisher in America. It was turned down by every single one. 
I got the most elaborately condescending letters from some of my old <laughs> friends. You know, dear David, you know, how great that you wanted to try your hand at writing fiction. You know. <laughs> but you're, you're a journalist, and you know, so f and find the people who bought the novel bought it only because they wanted a book of nonfiction. So they said, oh, you know, well, okay, we'll publish the novel, but the advance is for your second book. So I then sat down and I began rewriting it, and I rewrote it and I rewrote it, and, you know, I mean, still in print. I get, I mean, what people typically say to me is, you know, David, I like your books, but your first one is the best. And uh, so go figure, but that's how I became a novelist. Speaking of young people in the room, we have 20 young people. I'm trying to remember what, uh, can you say where you all are from? I know, but you're you're visiting from the Aspen community. Country day. Country day. Okay, good. We have students here. Thank you. Alma Gildenhorn is here. We want to thank her for sponsoring the series. And the question here, and then I'll get Ambassador Bird. Yes. Did you? Yeah. Oh, and Joe Gildenhorn, who uh, is also sponsoring the series, but not sitting with his wife. Hey, good <laughs> Go figure. Uh, I'm Bob Dreyfus from The Nation magazine. Hi, David. I, I thought the book was a great read. If I have one quibble with it, it's right at the beginning where. You talk about how Sophie has purchased a 2,000 euro leather jacket from YSL in Paris. And I'm thinking, is that like some kind of tip off that she's corrupt or something like that? So I wonder how many CIA folks buy $3,000 jackets. But anyway, my, my question More is. More than you might think, but I should say that is taken from life. My wife Eve bought that jacket. Oh. It's still the coolest I bought it for her. You know, I, I, I didn't ask you this question, but is there some Eve in Sophie? Yes. Okay, I won't go there. Anyway, but, my, but don't, I love his wife. Yeah. It is. My question is, I, I wanted you to say a little bit more about this containment wall in, in Afghanistan. Um, it seems to me, I guess my question is, can you tell me what Pakistan's and India's minimal interests might be in Afghanistan that might uh, be congruent in some sort of containment house for Afghanistan and, and whether we're doing anything overtly or covertly to move that along or whether we're just mystified by it because I, I see, it seems to me having reported on this for a long time now that that's the end game if there is one and so what is that containment house Look well, like me, given those two countries. Me, that's a great question. I actually I read your stuff. And I think it's great, um, and I should I should I should just note that um, the congruent interests um, are that, as Prime Minister S Singh has has stated, and this is controversial in India, um, real stability in India will not be possible when you have a very unstable Pakistan as a nuclear-armed neighbor. And real stability in Pakistan will not be possible until you have some stability in Afghanistan. So from the Indian side, um, you, can, you can draw that line directly. The Pakistanis always say that the reason they want to keep um, uh, you know, playing uh, with their proxy forces in an Afghanistan that then by definition remains unstable is that they're hedging. And, you know, the, the most common version is they're hedging against an American departure. And, and there's this whole sort of, you know, sorrowful, you abandoned us in this year, and you abandoned us, in, and it's sort of this history of American betrayal of Pakistan. We're an unreliable ally. We're going to leave them holding the bag. So no matter what we say, we're going to be gone and they have to worry about their security. There are some in Pakistan who understand that um, a settlement that preserved enough leverage for them over the government, but also was acceptable to India and Iran, which is going to have a vote here, uh, and Russia, and the, you know, um, is 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 a is a desirable outcome. Do they have the you know, the, the diplomats, the, the people on the c civilian side who could make that work. Does General Kiani, who will give lip service to it, really feel it in his, in his, in his gut? Um, I don't know, but, but, the, but in, in principle, the argument is there. Um, one of the underreported things, by intention on the, on the part of our government, is what Mark Grossman is doing. Mark Grossman succeeded Richard Holbrook as... Uh, special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and 
uh, where Richard was, you know, just the most flamboyant person you ever met uh, as part of his charm. Couldn't stay out of the newspapers. Uh, Marcus is is the most reticent. You know, Marcus is a man who just, you know, he, he, he you know, he, he um, has been almost invisible in this job, which is how he wants it. So what's he doing? You know, both openly in his meetings with foreign ministers and in other contacts that are proceeding through different channels. I mean, it's a measure of how discreet Mark is that I don't, I don't quite know. But I know that he's been very active. I know that one contact that I, I did write about after Der Spiegel had, had broken it with uh, a representative of Mullah Omar uh, uh, who met with a, a U.S. representative in Bonn. That's how the Der Spiegel leak happened. Um, uh, that that was a significant uh, diplomat, you know, dip, uh, negotiating channel. He disappeared su subsequent to uh, the disclosure of that. Are there other channels and other contacts? I'm certain that there are. Mm -hmm. um, where's that going? I don't. Is it going to build that structure? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, the paradox here, obviously is that to the extent that people perceive that we're leaving, and there's a timetable, publicly announced timetable for our departure, it, it gives leverage to those who are willing just to wait us out and say, why should we make the deal now when the deal we can get in 2014 is just much more advantageous? So uh, it's just a tough one. How, how, it's, a very, it's a classic negotiating kind of uh, uh, syllogism or, you know, uh, yeah, Ambassador Bart, yeah. Uh, David, I'd much rather listen to you talk about your craft as a novelist, but I, I, I'd like to return to the subject you initially raised, talking about the uh, Pakistani military. Uh, it, what, in your impression, are the kind of chief driving concerns of the military at this point? Uh, traditionally, of course, they've been mesmerized by the Indian threat and how they define it. But I would, I would assume that they have to be increasingly worried about the internal stability of Pakistan itself. And if that's the case, one would think that they would increasingly look for some kind of rapprochement with the Indians mm -hmm. so they could focus on the internal threat. But I don't have any real sign that that's happening. Well, I, you know, Rick, I... I think the uh, Pakistani military uh, isn't sure quite what it wants. One reason that Admiral Mullen has been so emphatic in private with General Kiani and then in public before the Senate is to force them to make a dis decisions that they're reluctant for understandable reasons to make. It's often said that uh, the Pakistani military's overriding concern is India, that They've never fully focused on this uh, terrorist threat because it's an army that has been trained to fight I India in a, in a you know, armored uh, combat in the plains uh, to the east of Lahore and you know, maybe a nuclear combat if it escalates. And they, you know, they have limited use. They're up there in the glaciers in the Himalayas every day and every night standing, facing off across the gorge. I actually think that um, a more accurate d statement would be that the overwhelming priority of the Pakistani military is its own reproduction as a, you know as a species, its survival, its you know its 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 role, its professional integrity. I mean, the reason that General Musharraf, in the end, um, was ousted, I think, was that the military had decided that he was bringing the military into disrepute. That there were, it was too corrupt a system. Too many generals were getting paid off with too visible uh, benefits, and so General Kiani, the son of an enlisted man, you know, a man who represented the ideal of professionalism that is deep in the Pakistani army, uh, became chief of army staff, and you know, and the army was reproducing itself. I should say that, you know, I, because I really am interested in the in the Pakistani military. I asked uh, before my, one of my most recent trips if I could lecture at the Army Staff College in Quetta, uh, partly because I always wanted to go to Quetta, which is really a crazy 
Wild West uh, city in the middle of Baluchistan. And they said, well, no, but why don't you come talk at the National Defense University? So I spent two hours with uh, senior officers, colonel and up, uh, in a very kind of session like this, very free-flowing, back and forth uh, discussion. And, and that reinforced what, what I just said, that, that this is a military that wants to be professional, wants to be strong, has, you know, in fact is worried about Islamist influence within its ranks, has ways of trying to assess whether officers are, are reliable or not. I mean, you know, the, this notion that they're becoming Islamist uh, in secret, um, you know, I don't, uh, you know, it's an Islamic country, there are people who are more and less pious, but uh, I, I think that the Army is very aware of that, of that danger. Just to say one final thing about, about the Pakistani military, there was a period in which they seemed to understand that they needed to take the threat of domestic terrorism more seriously. And that moment, as you'll all remember, was in the summer of 2009 when the Taliban in the, the, the Pakistani Taliban in the, in the Swat Valley, this magnificent, I mean truly it's one of the most beautiful places you've ever seen, um, had just taken over and the civilian authorities were, were in pell-mell retreat. Um, the, uh, it's a very windy road, it takes forever to get there, but it is about 90 miles from Islamabad. Uh, so it was right on their doorstep. And the army went in aggressively and decisively. I went to the Swat Valley uh, just after it had been secured and traveled with the army. And, you know, you can tell whether a place has been secured if you're riding around in, a, in, a, in an army jeep and whether you're, not, whether you're getting shot at, you know, whether you, so, I mean, and it, you know, it had been secured. And more to the point, I mean, there was a Pakistani two-star, first-rate officer, just an excellent officer who I met with there. Um, and he uh, said, the great thing about this campaign for us is that we have been very popular with the people here. They really didn't like what the Taliban were doing. And, you know, armies like to be popular. A, armies like to fight, you know, they, and they get better when they fight. B, armies like to be popular. And, you know, this, this Pakistani army always worries that it's unloved and... So, you know, they, they, they did this campaign, um, and there's, <laughs> it is an erotic army. Um, so they did, did this campaign in SWAT. It was, it was a success. They pushed the Taliban back. There's some very tough fighting because they all retreated up into these escarpments in this crazy uh, terrain uh, where helicopters, the air is so thin, helicopter blades can't bite. It's very hard to get up there. They did great. Okay, then they said... We're, next, we're going to go into South Waziristan, which is where um, Al Qaeda fled through Tora Bora into South Waziristan, um, and it was at that time the, the center of, of of what we thought was the sort of alliance of Al Qaeda and these militants. The Masud tribe at that time was the the big enemy, not the Zadran tribe, which is where the Haqqanis are, are from. So I said, this is where I said to General Pasha, I want to go to South Waziristan. I want to see, you know, what it's like. And, you know, he said, okay. And he picked up his cell phone and called somebody, and the next thing you know, I was on this goofy little plane. I tell this story because in Wana, uh, near the Afghan border, deep in South Waziristan, in the Pakistani garrison, was another just first-rate two-star general. Uh, it, was just getting, it was on the eve of launching this uh, invade, military invasion of South Waziristan. And he was just terrific. And he, I'll never forget his statement. You know, we are going to do this. We know that it's in, our security requires it, and we're going to do it. But I will, you know, he said, I will tell you, if there is an economic development here to bring jobs for people, it's not going to work. And I came back, and I just, I will just make a plea. I mean, there is something called the Reconstruction Opportunity Zone Bill, which has been, which would provide, you know, limited benefits for starting factories in or near the tribal areas. I mean, if you, if there's one thing that you say is, like, well, you know, that's in American interest. You know, we get some jobs for people there. It has been hung up with petty partisan bickering in our Congress now for four years. I mean, you look at this oh. and you think, what, what is wrong with us? 
because uh, I remember saying to this two-star, well, you know, listen, General, no matter what, you know, that, well, that bill will get passed. Americans are crazy, you know. Well, uh, So anyway, they did this. That was a success. People were really proud of their army for doing South Waziristan. Then bad stuff began to happen. The reasons why, you know, why in 2010 and, and the first half of 2011, this really good process was starting where the Pakistani army got serious about its problems and turned into what we see now, uh, you know, that's another book. But I, I just will, I, it's important to remember that there was a moment when they got it exactly right. Why was it lost? I don't know. And we could get it back conceivably. Well, yeah. that's, that's, I mean, I, yes, I mean, so, so you have a snapshot of what it would look like if they and we um, were getting serious mm -hmm. about this and doing it right. I want to make sure you get to sell books. I want to make sure we can have an informal conversation. So let me thank you very much. Politics and Prose is there to sell books. David will sign them, right? Definitely. Yes. We will try to set a record for the number of books sold in any of your Washington events. And at least we know why Sophie didn't end up in bed alone. <laughs> now that I met you based on Eve. <laughs> Sorry.